Okay, so your TMO greetings, yet I say everyone for tuning in. Um, this is actually a second part in reality to the uh, broadcast that we did um, just a few days ago. So let me pull that up for you real quick so you can see what we're dealing with. Okay. So we did a broadcast, uh, a live on Zoom, talking about the Heb Festival in ancient Kanit and Kemet, ancient Nubian Egypt. And that's the foundation for the Hudu Mind, Hudu Nation Festival that we have established. We established this festival. Uh, this, is, this will be our eighth year. So it's coming up October 15th. And this is the our page, our Hudu Mind, Hudu Nation Festival page and so forth. As you can see here, October 15th in Atlanta, Georgia. So this coming, Miminadai, this coming Saturday in Atlanta, we will have the festival. And we did a broadcast on the nature of the festival, the nature of what festivals are for to reestablish and reincorporate the values of our culture and so forth. So we went into detail about that. We talked about the nature of the Heb, that's the term for festival in ancient Kemet. Heb means festival, celebration, ritual, and so forth, but Heb also means to triumph, to overcome. So we establish these ritual practices to uh, um, acknowledge the fact that we have overcome certain obstacles, how we've overcome those obstacles, and how we need to move forward. So um, we went into detail about that, and we talked about a number of different things, but we want to get into some more detail on the hoodoo tradition, the nature of the hoodoo tradition. Let's go into... We're going to pull up our text once again, text on the Hoodoo tradition. This is our Hoodoo people page on our website. And this is our book, one of our books, Hoodoo people. And for those who are unaware, my name is Ojirafo Kwesi Radnehembata Akan, Ojirafo of Akwamumain Amaruka Tipimu. That's the Akwamu Nation in North America within Ojiramain, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere. When we use the term Ojiramain, that means the purified nation. We're talking about Black people in the Western Hemisphere in general. But the Akwamu Nation, Akwamu Mind, Amaruka Tifimu, the Akwamu Nation in North America, that is our organization. So, So when we talk about the hoodoo tradition, we start off in our text properly defining the hoodoo tradition and including the etymology of hoodoo. Hoodoo specifically is a Khan ancestral religion in North America, meaning a Khan people from Ivory Coast and Ghana, the contemporary regions of the countries of Ivory Coast and Ghana in West Africa, Africa West Africa today, those of our people who were taken from those regions and forced into the Western Hemisphere during the Musu Okesie, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era, we were forced into North America. Those Akan people who practice Akan ancestry religion and spoke Akan language and so forth and practice Akan culture, we continue to practice, of course, our Akan culture and passed on our Akan language to our descendants, whether you know, up front or hidden and so forth, we continue to practice our ancestral religious, you know, traditions. And therefore we maintain them. It is no different than people in Cuba who continue to practice the Yoruba tradition under the, you know, form of Lukumi, or people in Brazil who continue the Yoruba tradition under Candomblé, or Akan people in Suriname who continue to practice Akan ancestral religion, and it's called Winti in Suriname in South America. In Guyana, Akan ancestry religion was preserved and it's called Komfa from the Akan term, or Komfoa, which is a term for priest or priestess. Um, they continued Akan ancestry religion. In Suriname, when they call the tradition Winti, that's from the Akan term, Quinti, which talks about the nature of the spirits, the deities being spirits that are conjured or, or, or aroused and so forth through ritual. 
in Jamaica, Akan people continue to practice Akan ancestry religion under the, the title Obia, from the Akan term Obai, which has to do with ritual practice, misnomer witchcraft as ritual practice and so forth. So the same thing took place in North America. We often get this false information from our enemies, the whites and our offspring, as well as some of our own people who are misinformed that we did not preserve our traditions. We preserve our Khan ancestry religion intact in North America for hundreds of years under the title Undu, which came to be pronounced Kudu. That is our Khan ancestry religion in North America. We preserved our priesthoods, our priestesshoods, our divination practices, all of our cultural practices intact as a full system. So this idea that hoodoo is just botanical, you know, little practices or Afro-folk traditions or an amalgamation of different African traditions or pseudo-Native Americanism or pseudo-European occultism, that's pure foolishness and fraud. Hoodoo is specifically and directly the Akan ancestry religion that we have preserved in our blood circles that Akan people who practice authentic hoodoo continue to practice. So, now let's, I'm going to go out of this for a second. And let me pull this up real quick. Okay. Okay, so the reason why we, we're dealing with this particular topic is because once again, there's misinformation regarding the nature of the balance of male and female in Afro-Akani, afro, -Akani, afro -Akani, or African ancestral traditions in general, religious practices in general, as well as in Hudu because people are misrepresenting the hoodoo tradition because the vast majority of these people are not authentic practitioners because they're not Akan, they're not from the Akan ethnic group. You can't join the Akan ancestry religion and say, well, I'm Akan now, just like you can't join the Akan ethnic group. You can't join the Yoruba ethnic group. You can't join the Igbo ethnic group. You can't join an ethnic group. You must be born of that group, physically and spiritually, a spirit genetic inheritance. People who are spirit, spirit genetically Akan, that means physically descendant, as well as spiritually through specific blood circles. We have reincarnated, reborn through specific blood circles. Those people are Akan. And we continue the Akan ancestry religion as Hudu. If you're not Akan, you cannot practice Hudu. You should be looking at your own traditions in your own spirit genetic blood circle, finding out what ancestral clan you come from and reestablishing that tradition or finding out that that tradition has been reestablished or preserved in your families and continue, you know, you continue to practice that and build that back up. But you don't just join a tradition. Those people who say that you can just practice hoodoo and all you have to do is practice roots and so forth. Those are people who are admitting in different ways that they don't know anything about the tradition. Hold on one second, just want to let some people in. So, all right. So you have some Black people who've been, you know, indoctrinated by white culture, promoting misinformation about the Hoodoo tradition. Of course, our enemies, the whites and offspring, the parasites, they seek to latch on to the tradition. Of course, it's impossible for them to practice. They cannot communicate with any deity. They cannot communicate with any honored ancestress or ancestor. So it's impossible for them to practice. All they're doing is engaging in fraudulent misinformation and passing it off as tradition. All right. So that includes European notions of what sexuality is. They begin to pr promote this false idea that homosexuality, dissexuality, and we use the term dissexuality, dis meaning not, as in disorder, dislike, and so forth dissexuality because sexuality is not occurring when you're engaged in quote unquote same sex behavior, that discordant behavior, that mental illness and so forth. 
So they would try to promote the idea that homosexuality, dissexuality was accepted or is accepted in the Hoodoo tradition. It has never been and never will be. The forces in nature, the deities, the abosom as they're called in Akan, or Orisha as they're called in Yoruba, or Vodou as they're called in Eve and Fong, Arusi as they're called in Igbo, or Ntoru, Ntoru too as they're called in our ancestral language of ancient Kanid Kemet, the deities hate dissexuality, homosexuality they have never supported. It's no different than child molestation, bestiality, or any other form of sexual deviance. The whites and their offspring seek to force that perversity into our culture and brainwashed individuals amongst within our population seek to promote that as well. So this is why we need to address that. So let's look at some details. Now, first we, as we did in the previous broadcast, we wanna properly um, touch on the definition of hoodoo. And our book here, Hoodoo People, Afurakanu, Afurakainu Africans in North America, Akan Custodians of Hoodoo from Ancient Hoodoo Ndunu Land, Kanit Nubia. This is the first book that properly identifies Akan culture and Akan people as the founding culture and the source culture of the Hoodoo tradition. We're the first to properly define the term Hoodoo and show it without any debate in the Akan language and many other things that we've shown in this book. So it's a seminal work because others tried to pretend like Hoodoo comes from the Congo language, it comes from the Dogon, or comes from Yoruba, or comes from the Eve, or they're manufacturing things. White people tried to say it came from the Irish or comes from the Jews and all kinds of nonsense, always seeking to corrupt. But it, it takes someone who is actually Akan from the Akwamu ethnic group who maintained this tradition in our families for you know centuries to bring the proper information forward. So this book is the first to do that. So we showed that the Akan term du, eduru, plural nduru, means medicine. And the in Asanti dialect is nduru, eduru, singular, nduru, um, plural. In the Akwamu Akan dialect from the Akwamu Akan ethnic group, Akwamu is a subgroup of Akan, Asanti or Ashanti is a subgroup of the Akan ethnic group. But in the Akwamu Akan dialect, instead of nduru, it's ndu, meaning medicine from roots, trees, and plant life. And then we were showing the relationship between ndu in ancient Kemet, ndun, and nduru in Akwamu. But we don't have to go through that. We went through that in the previous, you know, uh, broadcast. But dua or dria to plant, plant, tree, shrub, and so forth, plural, ndria. So ndua, ndria. The undu, the medicine, comes from the undua or undria, the plant life, and so forth, the shrubs, plants, trees, that's where the medicine comes from. And we were showing the relationship between undu and unduru, medicine, medicinal substance, and ancient command, undun, undunu, medicine, medicinal substance, Ndua, tree, plant, plants in the Akan language. Undun, Undunu, tree, plant, plants in the language of ancient Kemet in the Medutu, the hieroglyphs. We have the Undun Sin, Undun Sini, and Undun Sini Fall, the individuals that function as native physicians, medicine men and medicine women, and so forth, the healers, healeresses. That's what the Udun Sini Fall, the root is Undu, dealing with the medicine. You also have the Odu Yefo in the Asante dialect, it's the Oduru Yefo, but in the Akwamu dialect, it's Odu Yefo. That's also a ritual practitioner, but mainly a conjurer and so forth. So you have the Odun Sinifo, a root doctor, Odu Yefo, the root worker and so forth. Ye means to act, to do, or to work. So the Undu Ye means the worker of the Undu, the root worker. Undu sin is unseen is the stump of a tree and so forth. Odun sini, the medicine man, you know, native physician and so forth. So you have a root doctor, root worker, also country. So we have these related terms in the Akan language, not just the term hoodoo, but the hoodoo yefo, 
who do sing fo, the undu, sini fo, undu, yefo, and so forth, all rooted from the term undu, meaning medicine, and it comes from the unduwa, the trees, the plants, and so forth. And then we also have the term duru, which is also undu, means heaviness or weight, to become heavy with the spirit through spirit possession, spirit communication. And we showed in ancient command, undun also means to become heavy and heaviness of weight and so forth. And then the same term, dudu, meaning to descend, dismount a light, come or go down, to feel a presentiment of foreboding. Unduruwi, divine ordinance. So when we talk about undu, meaning to become heavy, that means heavy with the spirit, through spirit possession, the spirit has come down, possessed the individual. Now they have a feel heavy, they're heavy with the spirit and so forth. That's how we explain it in the hoodoo tradition in English. But undu means to become heavy with the spirit. Undu also means the spirit coming down to a light upon the individual. And you begin to feel a presentiment or foreboding. You can see what's happening, unfolding in the spirit realm and let the person know through divination what's taking place and how to avoid negative circumstances and how to overcome certain obstacles to enhance your life and so forth. So undu meaning medicine from plants, trees, and so forth. Unduwa meaning the plants and trees and plant life and so forth, including mineral life and so forth. Undu being become heavy. Undu, the spirit descending upon you, coming down to descend a, to a light upon so that you can feel a presentiment of foreboding, engage in the divinatory process. All of this is tied up into the term undu. prior to our putting that information out and showing it etymologically in the language of the Akan people, as well as ancient Kanid and Kemet with the exact same meanings, as we show in this book, people were unaware of that information. And we show all the relations here, undu, unduwa, du, duru, durushe, uduyefo, udun sinifo, and so forth. And this was the article, the original article that we published, the Akan origin of the term hoodoo, but we just went into much more detail in the book. So, so let's move on to another aspect of that etymology to give further definition to the hoodoo tradition, which is also called kanja. Now, In the book, Mojo Working, the Old African-American Hoodoo System by Dr. Katrina Hazard, she lays out a number of different, you know, issues within the Hoodoo tradition and culture and historical information and a number of different things. In the back of the book, she has a glossary. You'll see here it says Hoodoo, the traditional Black Belt African-American folk healing and spiritual controlling system. Um, so, but what we want to show is, you'll see the term mojo, a traditional African-American amulet, a genuine mojo or mojo bag. Then you have jack and jack ball, talking about the same thing. Another name for a type of hoodoo amulet or mojo bag. So you have the mojo, which is also called a mojo bag, mojo hand and so forth. But then you have the jack, another form of a hoodoo amulet another kind of mojo bag and so forth. And Jack, Jack Ball is the same thing as saying this term has two usages, one for the divination device, similar to the walking boy in which a weighted mojo ball was suspended from a string about 18 to 20 inches long and used the same way as the walking boy. The other use for the term is to designate a type of amulet carried for protection and love, as in I got my Jack Ball with me tonight. The African-American dance known as Ball and the Jack is a hoodoo reference. So you have the mojo and the jack. Jack is also called the jack ball. So that's one thing. Now let me back up a little bit. You'll also see the term kanja, and they'll spell, she spells it in English, kanja, another name for either the hoodoo tradition or a conjurer a root work. 
So that's the term they, they would hear someone say, Kanja, Kanja man, Kanja woman. Europeans would say, well, they're trying to say conjure, but they're mispronouncing it. They're using Ebonics and they're saying Kanja, Kanja, Kanja man, Kanja woman, Kanja man, Kanja woman. Now, we said, of course, hoodoo is the Akan tradition. She says another name for either the hoodoo tradition or a hoodoo worker, a kanji man, kanji woman, or simply that's a kanji. Let's go into some detail about that to further prove where the tradition comes from. I just want to make sure we can uh, see that. Okay, now, so what you should be seeing on your screen is Kanche. If you're not, just let me know in the chat room. Another one of our publications, properly defining the Hoodoo tradition. So Kanche, Akan, origin of the term Kanjur is Hoodoo. So prior to us publishing this, people assume that the term kanje, pronounced by quote-unquote African-Americans, Afurakani, Afurakani people in America, was simply an Ebonic way of saying conjure, as in conjuring up spirits, and another, you know, title of the Hoodoo tradition. We show that it's not con term. If you look in the Asante Fanti Dictionary, the Twi Akan Dictionary, you will see that the term kanche, to pray, rehearse, or speak a prayer, to invoke or call upon, they say the fetish, that means the dead. And then n kanche, that's the verb, and then n kanche, the noun, prayer, invocation. It also kanche, to make a sign with straight or curved lines on a level surface, to mark or make a stroke or a line, and that has to do with divination and so forth. So you're talking about prayer, ritual invocation to invoke or call upon a divinity, kanche. Kanche is comprised of two akan words. It's a compound term. The first term is ka with the nasal a, so it's kan, like a k-a-n sort of, like a nasal a or n, kan. To, it means to emit a sound, to utter, speak, say, or tell in the Akan language. Then we make a comparison just to show that we didn't get this term from Europeans. If ka means to emit a sound, to speak, say, or tell, then if we look at the language of ancient Kemet, our ancestral language, we should find the same term with the same meaning. When we look in the language of ancient Kanid and Kemet, in the Medutu, the so-called hieroglyphs, kai, that's one spelling, and ka is another spelling, to think, think out, to devise, meditate, to speak, repeat, say, cry out, call out, tell out. To speak, say, call out, tell out. Speak, say, or tell, emitting a sound. So the same word in ancient, in Akan culture is the same term in ancient Kemet, ka. We also have the term, another aspect of the term in the Akan language, as you can see from the Akan dictionary, ka, to surrender oneself to a fetish, meaning a deity or patron spirit. Now, in ancient Kemet, you have the term ka, which is also the term for soul, divine consciousness, and you have the term hem, ka, which means servant, him of the Ka, also means a priest of the Ka, one who serves the Ka, serves the soul, the divine consciousness, and so forth. The him Ka, that's the title of a certain kind of priest or priestess, is one who surrenders the service to the divinity. So when we talk about Ka, meaning to surrender to the patron spirit, you have an ancient.
Okay, so let me know if you are you all can hear me in the chat room. It just went out and I just brought it back in. I just want to make sure you all can hear. Just uh, give me a thumbs up in the chat room if you can hear. Okay. Okay, may I say. So, so I just had to switch over to a different... Uh, Second. Okay, so we have that term ka, meaning to speak, say, tell out. It also means to surrender to the spirit. And then you also have ka in ancient Kanita command. Now, the second part of the term is che. It means to become clear or visible, to appear, come to light, to come or bring forth to obtain or impart subsistence is only used in connection with adie, the day breaks and so forth, che, to become hard, a che, a forthcoming salutation, greeting, especially in the morning. To say good morning in Akan is ma, a che, ma means to give, and a che means dawning, to come forth, as in the coming forth of the sun. So when it says to become clear, visible, to appear, come to light, come to bring forth, when you say ma che, you're saying I give you ma a che dawn. That means the sun is rising. It's becoming clear, becoming visible, coming to light. That which was in the underworld, the sun in the underworld and so forth in the darkness, now once the sun begins to rise and the rays shoot out and so forth, things become clear, visible, appear come to light, and we say ma che, ma che, or me ma wo a che, meaning I give you ma a, a che, the coming forth of the sun, light, visibility, and so forth. Now, we say that right here, and che che also means to bind or tie together and so forth. So, we say che means the coming forth, to come forth into light, to appear. When we call and invoke the abosom, the deities, through kan che, when you evoke a divinity, just like when a child, you know, cries out and so forth because they, a, a, an infant cries out and releases sound vibrations, cries out to the mother, the sound vibrations penetrate the ear of the mother and provokes the mother to respond by giving the child breast milk and so forth child cries out to the great being and the great being responds to those sound vibrations, that energy by feeding the child with the subsistence that the child needs. When we invoke or call on the Abos song through ritual prayer, ritual chant, ritual song, ritual incantation, then those sound vibrations provoke the energy of those divinities and then they come forward. The spirits that were in the unseen realm, then they come down and descend and possess and do operate within the world of the seen. That power that was unseen is now seen. No different than when the sun was in the underworld at nighttime in the darkness. Once it manifests, you know, at sunrise, then first and foremost, the path is illuminated. There's illumination, but then there's also empowerment. The light of the sun illuminates the path so you can find your way around and navigate your way around but the fire, the energy of the sun empowers you and vitalizes you. When we invoke the divinities, the spirits that were in the unseen manifest in the seen through spirit possession, not only do they give us divine wisdom and guidance to navigate our way through life, but they also empower us through spirit possession. So, kan che means to speak, utter, say, or tell, ka, and then a che, to bring the spirits of the Abosom, the deities, and the ancestral spirits forward to communicate with the community. We say the immaterial spirit has now been concretized, housed in a physical vessel. We thus have the reduplication of the term chen. And you'll see chen, chen means to bind, tie up, bind together, become firm, hard, solid, to congeal, concrete. So when the spirit possesses, then, you know, becomes in, encased in physical matter and so forth, that invisible spirit now becomes solidified and so forth. When it shows up, now we can communicate 
on a spiritual and a physical level. The spirit becomes concretized in the physical matter. That's spirit possession. Then we show the connection to ancient Kemet. We said, I chant means to become visible, come clear as in the sun rising and manifesting on the horizon. That's the dawning, that's the morning. We say ma chant. We give you dawning, give you morning, clearing, visibility, and so forth. Chant in the language of ancient Kemet, to rise like the sun, or like a king on his throne when the king ascends to the throne for the first time, that's like the sun manifesting on the horizon. To ascend, shine, to appear of a god or king in festive possession. Um, but also, so what you see is the hieroglyph here. The first portion on the bottom is the sun itself. And then on the top are the rays shooting from the sun. It's the sun just peeking above the horizon. It's not fully up in the sky yet. It's a full disk. It's just peeking above the horizon. The rays are just shooting out. It's that sunrise. The sun, the light is coming to appear. Che, meaning to ascend, to rise like the sun. I che, and I can, to become clear, visible, as is the sun rising and so forth, the morning. So ka, che, to speak, say, utter, tell, to speak, or utter incantations, ka, to make the spirits of the deities and ancestral spirits come forward, a che, that's kan che, and then ka in ancient Kemet means to speak, utter, say, or tell, and a che, the coming forth of the sun and the divinity, male and female, that manifests through the solar energy and so forth, ka and che becoming the term kan che, has nothing to do with conjure in English. These are two Akan terms that are combined to deal with a ritual practice, and they're derived directly from ancient Kanid and Kemet, the same two terms with the same meanings. So any fool talking about when we said Kanje man and Kanje woman, we were speaking the Akan language. A Kanje man is a Kanche man. A Kanje woman is a Kanche woman. One who speaks, utters incantations, ka to make the spirits Ache come forth. So, prior to us publishing that, none of the European scholars who write about hoodoo or none of the Black scholars who wrote about hoodoo ever understood where the term conjure came from and why hoodoo is also called conjure. Sometimes they say this is the hoodoo tradition and we practice hoodoo. Sometimes people will say we practice conjure, but they can never give you a reason why they say we practice hoodoo or conjure because they didn't know that hoodoo comes from undu in the Akan tradition and conjure comes from kanche. And undu and kanche has always been the terminology we've used for thousands of years. So we see here hoodoo and conjure, undu and kanche properly define our ritual practices as Akan people in North America. So if you don't understand the Akan tradition, and the Akan culture, then you can't properly define these terms in the, in the hoodoo tradition. You'll just think they're a collection of different terms or English terms that people were using, but you don't see their cosmological connection, their foundation. But we've provided that. Now. We're going to pull up a couple of things here. Hold on a second, let me just pull this up. Uh, let me pull up this other piece, as a matter of fact. All right.
Now, when it comes to this notion of hoodoo sexuality and so forth and how we conduct ourselves in the hoodoo tradition, this is one of our books. We have 31 books we've published. This is one of them. This one is talking about Ra, the creator of the universe, and Ra at the creatress of the universe. They are called a Yonkun poem and a Yonkun tone in the Akan tradition. And we demonstrate that in this book, showing who they are cosmologically, but also showing that they exist in the Akan tradition and by the names of why those names are those, you know, they have those designations. One of the first things that we establish Here you have Ra once again. This is the deity Pata. This is the deity Atem. And this is the deity Amen. And it's important to note, and we always note this this is Amen, sometimes called Amen Ra. And this is Amenet, sometimes called Amenet Ra'et. Amen is the great father, Amenet is the great mother, and together they comprise the two halves of the divine whole called the supreme being. They are called Inyame and Inyame Wanaka. Amen becomes Inyame and Aka. Amenet or Amenat becomes Inyame Wa and Aka. This is the great mother and great father, supreme being. They are the grandparents of Ra and Ra, the creator and creatress. We always use the example that the creator and creatress, Ra and Ra'et, or Nyonkumpon and Nyonkumpon, these two divinities, they are the divine living energy animating all of creation. That includes within the Afurakani, Afurakani body. So your body is an Afurakani man or Afurakani woman, African black man, African black woman. You are an emanation of Amen and Amenet. So your body is like Amen if you're an Afarakani man. Your body is like Amenet, the great mother, on a microcosmic level, in miniature and so forth. As an Afarakani woman, the great mother and so forth. You're the great being. And then that divine living solar energy that circulates throughout your being, your spiritual force, that is your Ra force if you're a male, your Ra'et force if you're a female. So you're the great being and you have divine solar energy circulating throughout your spirit body that you can direct to your arms and legs and different parts of your body to empower yourself and act and create and so forth. You are Amen directing your Ra force. You're Amenet directing your Ra at force. That is the force that you use to not build, not only build and develop and innovate and so forth, but it's also the force operating through your reproductive organs that allows you to procreate children and bring specifically Afurakani, Afurakani ancestral spirits back into the world. That is your creative force, your pro-creative force that is directed by you, the great being. Ra and Ra'et, the creator and creatress, are grandchildren of Amen and Amenet, the supreme being. So the creator and creatress are not the same as the supreme being. They are grandchildren, literally, of the supreme being. Most of our people who follow the misinformation of Europeans get that mixed up. So, so this is an image from the Temple of Apet, Reset, so-called Luxor in Kemet. And this is a temple that we actually visit when we travel to Kemet, and we will be traveling to Kemet in May for our second annual tour. We just came back this past May, well, June actually, um, on, a, on our tour to Kometa, we're taking people again. So if you'd like to sign up for that tour, of course, you can do that. We'll talk about that at the end of the piece. But this is Amen and Amenet. They are the foundational relationship of creation. The oldest religious texts, compositions, and existence yet unearthed in the world are the Meru, or so-called pyramid texts. And then in these oldest religious compositions that have been found anywhere in the world, you find Amen and Amenet together as divine counterparts. There's never been a time when there was just Amen, the great God, and not Amenet, the great goddess. There was never a time when there was just Amenet, the great goddess or great mother, without Amen, the great father, 
they are two halves of the divine whole. They are the foundational relationship in creation. Everything natural is patterned after amen and amenet. This is why there's a balance of male and female. So dissexuality, homosexuality is insane. It's idiotic, it's mental illness, it's spiritual discordance. It's out of harmony with divine order. You will notice that only Europeans, the Eurasian, promote the insanity and perversity of dissexuality, homosexuality as something normal. They have been promoting that for thousands of years because it's a reflection of the discordance of their spirits. They are disconnected from divine order. That's who they are. They're the cancerous cells in the body of black humanity. It's like cancerous cells developing in your body and becoming wayward and seeking to consume and destroy other cells until your immune and lymphatic system kills them and expels them from the body. They are the cancer cells moving throughout the earth trying to consume and destroy everything in their path. Quite naturally or unnaturally, they manifest this desire to promote this perversity. But that has nothing to do with us. When any of our people embrace that, we're not born gay, born bisexual, all of that nonsense. That comes from the whites and offspring promoting that foolishness. So we're gonna get into that. So, but they're the foundation of creation. They are the foundational relationship of creation and everything is patterned after them. This is reality, the reality of creation. Now. You will find them, of course. So you have Amen and Amenet. When they talk about the primordial eight divinities of creation, Well, Ka and Kaet, also called Kaka and Kakaet, and so forth. The black substance of space, Hehu and Hehu, the vital energy, the breathing principle within the black substance, Nun and Nunet, the wave energy or root energy of being within the black substance that eventually gave birth to Ra and Ra, the creator and creatress. We talk about that process of Amen and Amenet establishing the primordial black substance of space, Ka and Kaet, introducing the male and female forces of expansion and contraction within that black substance, so-called dark energy and dark matter in that black substance, expansion and contraction took place. Then the birth of noon and Nanette, the primordial wave energy within the black substance, which eventually manifested as the explosion of fire and light. And that was the birth of Ra and Ra'et in creation. And that explosion of fire and light through the black substance began to carve out black spheres and penetrate those black spheres and illuminate them. And those became the first stars from which became planets and so forth. We go through that cosmology here, but you'll see. And then we also show, of course, in this text that the rainbow serpent swallowing the sun as well as the moon, the solar disk, the lunar orb and so forth, the rainbow around the sun, moon and so forth you'll find that is the origin of the solar disk with the dot and so forth. It's Medutu symbols of Ra and Ra, the names are spelled in the hieroglyphs and so forth. The dual rainbows, they're the rainbow serpent, the creator and creatress. Then you find the exact same thing in Vodun, Da and Aidalpuedo, the male and female rainbow serpents, the you know um, creator and creatress, representing the collective ancestry of Afurakani, Afurakani people. And you find, of course, in Yonkunpon and in Yonkunton, in Akan, which is the rainbow serpents, male and female, creator and creatress, and all of that. Same as Odumare and Oshumare and Yoruba. And then we show the serpent swallowing its tail um, in the heavens and on earth and so forth in this text as well. So we just go into some detail about that in this text, but we were showing Ra and Ra at the creator and creatress coming from ultimately our man and Amenet, the great mother and great father, supreme being, Ka and Kayat, the male and female force of the black substance of space, Hehu and Hehu, the expansive and contractive breathing principle within creation, within that black substance, Nun and Nanet, the male and female force of primordial energy that will give birth to all forms of energy and so forth, and then Ra and Raya exploding from that black substance as creator and creatress. There's not just a creator, there's a creator and creatress, male and female balance. And you'll see that throughout 
every aspect of creation, the balance of male and female. Now, when we understand that, and let me pull this up right quick and we're gonna get back to it. When we're talking about balance, we're familiar with the female divinity, Ma'at. Many of our people are, but this is the male divinity, Ma'a. He's the male divinity of divine law and balance. This particular image, and you can see his name spelled with the plinth, which is, and the sickle here. So that's Ma'a, and then the perpendicular papyrus, um, rolled papyrus, that is the determinative symbol, but his name is spelled there, Ma'a, that is from the temple, um, or not the temple, but the tomb of Ramesu the sixth, or so-called Ramses the sixth, but Ra Mesu the sixth, it's in the Valley of the Kings in ancient Kemet. That is a uh, picture that I took myself when I was in Kemet, when we were on our tour and so forth, saved that and, you know, you know, published it and so forth. But that's, the, that's just one of the many places where you'll find the male deity Ma'a, but he's the force of divine balance on the masculine side in creation. She is the force of divine balance on the feminine side. Ma'a and Ma'at are the male and female forces of divine law and balance. There's no balance or order in creation without Ma'a and Ma'at. You will hear individuals talk about Kemet, and they will talk about Ma'at and everything was based on Ma'at and the people of ancient Kemet dealt with Ma'at and they dealt, dealt with law and balance and so forth, but they won't mention the male deity Ma'at. Of course, Europeans won't focus on that because they're not focused on that, including European Egyptologists, but even our people who study about Kemet or they may have changed their names or they may become priests and priestesses or have organizations or shrine houses or going on trips and taking people on study tours, yet you've never heard them mention the male divinity, Ma'a. He's one half of the divine order, the expansive pole of the divine order that governs all of creation. There is no creation without Ma'a, just like there's no creation without Ma'at. And when it comes to relationships and sexuality, they are critical to the divine balance of all things in creation, of course, inclusive of male and female relationships. And that, of course, was inherited in our traditions in the hoodoo tradition. They exist in the hoodoo tradition. He is called Abam in the hoodoo tradition. She's Amame in the hoodoo tradition and so forth. So he's also called Ama Su and she's called Ama Ria, which is Ma Su and Ma Ria in the Akan tradition, the balance of male and female. They exist in the Yoruba tradition, um, the Vodun tradition in different names. Every tradition understands who these forces of divine law and balance are, these twin divinities that regulate the divine balance of male and female throughout all of creation. So, so when we have that foundation, you can actually see the divinity. When we engage in ritual practice, we invoke these deities. Part of that ritual practice is invoking Ma'a, invoking Ma'at, Amma, Ria, Amma, Siu, and so forth for your own spiritual balance. If you don't even know that the male deity of divine law and balance exists, and you promote the idea that balance in creation is just female, then there's a imbalance already. And then when someone tries to introduce this sexuality, homosexuality, and says, well, in African tradition, you know, we don't, we're not concerned about who you love and all that foolishness, that comes from Europeans. When people promote ma'at, 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 but they've never even heard of ma'a, then they're imbalanced from the start. And it makes people susceptible intellectually of reaching towards and embracing and accepting imbalanced relationships. Now, let's go further. Because these very same deities are invoked in the Hoodoo tradition, in the Akan tradition in West Africa, Africa and into the Hoodoo tradition in North America. This goes to a nation building for our people, the first principal value of manhood and womanhood within our tradition, within the Akan tradition, and just our people across the board, 
is recognizing the divine balance of male and female. In fact, let's just, we're going to pull up our books real quick, just so you can see that first principle. We have our book, Afurakani Manhood, or Berima Afurakani Manhood. And when you click on that book and when we look in the in the in the chapters and so forth, it's seven chapters, seven sections based on the seven principal values of manhood. And they're governed by the seven days of the week and the deities that govern the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies that govern the seven days of the week. And when we look at the seven principal values of manhood, the first principal value is order to recognize the divine order of creation, the balance of male and female. The second principal value is balance to establish that balance in every aspect of your existence. And you will find the seventh principal value of manhood is ancestry. But the sixth principal value is marriage. Participate fully in the divine order of creation through uniting with the Afraikaidi female who is your balance. And when we go through each section of the book, seven sections, seven principal values, seven deities that govern the seven days of the week. So every day of the week is governed by one of the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies and a divinity, a male divinity that animates the solar, lunar, and planetary body of that day. And you have a principal value of manhood that carries the energy of that day of the week. So every Afurakani man, wherever we exist in the world, we're on the same page every day of the week. The energy that governs the day empowers the principle that governs the day. And that's something we can incorporate within ourselves. And when we go through the book, we look at the, that first principle value, order. If you're a man, your first principle value as being a man is order. Recognize the divine order of creation, the balance of male and female. You have to recognize that reality first. And of course, we show this is Amenet, but this is Amen and Amenet standing side by side and so forth. That is in the temple of um, Asetu or Karnak, which we will visit and you will see them there and so forth in that temple. The second principle value in the second chapter is balance. Once you recognize the divine order of creation, the balance of male and female, establish that balance in every aspect of your existence. And then we go into detail about that. And then we go through all the different pieces. And then of course you will see And just so we can, the sixth principle value, marriage, participate fully in the divine order of creation through uniting with the Afraikaidi female who is your balance. That's the sixth principle value of manhood based on the sixth day of the week, which is governed by Afi, so-called Venus, which is Het Heru, as well as the divinity men and so forth. So we have that. But then when we look also in the, Or by time book, Afuraikaidi Womanhood book, there are seven principal values of womanhood. And we have the same principal values, but slightly different based on the energy complex of men and women. But the first principal value of Afuraikaidi Womanhood recognize the divine order of creation, the balance of male and female. Balance is the second principal value. Perpetuate that balance in every aspect of your existence. And the way a woman does that is based on female energy. And the way a man does that is based on male energy and so forth. But the principles are the same. And then you'll see the six attune, participate fully in the divine order of creation via marriage. Attune yourself to the Afrakani male who's your balance. Just like on the male side, participate fully in that divine order of creation by um, marriage with the Afrakani female who is your balance. We're talking about the balance of male and female. We're talking about principal values of manhood and womanhood that every Akan child, male and female learns as they go through that puberty process, that manhood and womanhood training. That's foundational for our society. That is the hoodoo tradition that we preserved as Akan people into North America. This is Akan religion. So when we're talking about these deities in the Akan tradition and the divinities that govern us and so forth, 
in the Akan tradition, we brought that to North America. It continued in the Hoodoo tradition. So you won't find any dissexuality, homosexuality, or any interracialism in the Hoodoo tradition. You'll find that in fraudulent or pseudo inauthentic pseudo practices of the Hoodoo tradition. But in the real authentic Akan tradition, which is Hoodoo, you will never find that because that's disorder. We don't deal with anybody outside of our race because that's insane and perverse, dealing with spirits of disorder. We only deal with Afurakani men, Afurakani women. That's the only true balance you can ever have. And then, of course, of the proper age also. And then, of course, um, the balance of male and female. There's no same sex in it. Now, let's look cosmologically at why that's the reality. One of our other books, Call Call Ball, it's a series of articles that we published and combined into one text. Europeans promoted this false idea that there were certain texts and all the thousands of texts in Kemet, they found a few texts, four or five texts and so forth, that they said um, represented that people of ancient Kemet accepted homosexuality. So we took the very text that they talked about and showed the actual translations and the cosmology behind them proving conclusively that we did not accept dissexuality, homosexuality in ancient Kemet or any Afurakani, Afurakani tradition. And it doesn't have anything to do with Black people becoming Christians and Muslims. And then because of Christians and Muslims and Victorian, you know, Puritan values, we became against homosexuality. That's fraud as well. That's some foolishness floated by Europeans in the present day. In the first section of the book, we have the divine prohibition against dissexuality, homosexuality, and ancient command. And when you look at the text, this is a section of what are often called the 42 enunciations of Ma'at, admonitions of Ma'at, and so forth. Some people say the 42 laws of Ma'at. In reality, the reason you see this text and you see these different deities sitting here, there are 42 deities. And when you look at the reason why there are 42 divinities, when you look at the nation of Kemet and it's divided up into 42 administrative divisions or so-called uh, sepatu, in the United States, that's akin to like the 50 states. The country is divided up into 50 states, plus the capital, Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia, and so forth, the capital. But you have 50 states plus the capital. In ancient Kemet, we had 42 sepatu, so-called gnomes, misnomered gnomes in Greek and so forth. Administrative divisions, you could say 42 states, plus the capital, which made 43. It's like United States is 50 states, but the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., or District of Columbia, the district is not a state. It's the capital for the entire nation, but it's not part of a state. So we had 42 administrative divisions, Sepatu, and then the capital, which makes the 43rd division. In your body, you have 43 pairs of nerves that regulate the entire body. These 42 divinities govern the 43 pairs of quote-unquote nerves that regulate the body of creation. And of course, this is why in ancient Kemet, the nation was um, built off the, the physical body. Since the physical body has 43 pairs of nerves that send signals to every part of the body and regulate order in the body, then when they established the nation, it was patterned after the physical body. And so they have 40 three administrative divisions, the 42 divisions plus the capital making 43, regulated by 42 um, divinities plus the judge, which is Asa. And then when you look at creation itself, you have these 42 divinities plus Asa and so forth, which makes 43 three that regulate the spirit realm. So on every level from the physical body, the spirit realm, the nation itself, and creation itself, you have these 42 divinities plus the judge, which makes 43. So this is why you have that. And in the text, when they talk about the 42 laws of Ma'at or enunciations of Ma'at, 
what's happening is a person goes before each one of these 42 divinities because they govern a different aspect of creation. You go before all of them, then you've gone before the divinities that regulate all aspects of creation. Just like the 43 pairs of nerves regulate through a communicative structure every aspect of your body without those 43 sets of nerves, doesn't matter that you have a heart or a spleen or liver, communication is not happening between them properly. You need the 43 sets of nerves to regulate communication between everything and the body. So these 42 um, divinities plus the judge and so forth regulate the communicative force of everything within the body of creation, as well as our, our bodies, which are your spirit bodies, which are a microcosm of that. So when you go before each one of these divinities, that's like purifying each one of your sets of nerves until all of your nerves are fully purified and working functionally and properly and you're in alignment with them and so forth. This is what's happening with that particular text. So what we say is in the so-called Pert Emiru, misnomer book of the dead, book of coming forth by day, we say, in order to live in harmony and perpetuity after death in the ancestral realm, as well as during life in the physical realm, the Afurakani Afurakani individual must ritually invoke the 42 Ntoru, Ntoru to the goddesses and gods and so forth, who are judges of Ma'a and Ma'a divine law, in order to harmonize with the energy of these spirit forces in creation. They who are embodiments of divine order in creation, their energy is invoked. We talk about Kanche to invoke a divinity, ritual invocation to call a divinity. Once the energy is invoked and the divinity manifests, then that energy can be internalized, infused, and replenished within the individual. We say like a drop of water fusing with the river, harmonizing with this greater force body of water in nature, so does the Afurakani, Afuraikani, the African Black individual, fuse his or her energy with the energy of the spirit force in nature that he or she is invoking ritually. This opens the way for one to align himself or herself with the divine order in creation. So we play ritual drums, Ritual chant, ritual prayer, ritual dance, ritual song, ritual meditation, ritual copulation with our spouse and so forth to open the gateway to align ourselves, to invoke the forces in nature, that energy becomes abundant, that then we can align ourselves with that energy of divine order and reorder and restructure our lives. That's the invocatory process. So we say, however, in the process of accepting, receiving the infusion of energy, divinely ordered energy from the divinities, the individual must reject perversity, disordered energy, which can manifest as a result of disordered thoughts, intentions, and or actions. So the individual invokes, meaning accepts the energy of the divinities, the spirits of divine order, and then repels disorder. Just like when you consume food, you take in the nutrients so you can be empowered and strengthened and replenished, but then you also eliminate the waste. You don't want the waste to stay inside of you. You accept the nutrients, you reject the waste. You attract the nutrients, you repel the waste. When you breathe in, you take in oxygen, you purify yourself, but then you breathe out the toxins, the carbon dioxide and so forth. It's expansion and contraction. We invoke the divinities, we align ourselves with divine order, we also reject or repel any forms of thoughts, intentions, or actions that will create disorder in creation and therefore in our lives. So, if you look at this text, each one of these divinities, if someone was watching a person, if you went into the, uh, in the home of an Akan person, you come into our home, you greet somebody, remove your shoes and so forth. And the first thing you do is first go to the shrine, the Nkomre, and salute the shrine of the Abosum, the divinity, and the Nsamafo, the ancestral spirits and so forth. And after you greet them, then you sit down and have a conversation with the person you're visiting and eat and do whatever you normally do. But the first thing you do is pay homage to the Abosum and Nsamafo. You go before the shrine to invoke 
If you went into the home of a Yoruba person, you will see the um, the quote unquote warriors at the door, Ogun or Shosi and Alegba and so forth. And you would invoke them. You would invoke the Adrogun and so forth, the warriors. And then you go into the person's home and you will greet them, but you will go and if they have an Orisha shrine, you would you know, greet them if they have an Egun shrine, an Ojubo and so forth for their ancestresses and ancestors, you will salute them. And then you'll go about the business of the day. So we're accustomed to doing. We're living in a traditional village and so forth, certain times of the day, week, month, year. You go to the shrines of the deities, you invoke them, you engage in ritual, you give offerings and so forth. You're accustomed to going before these divinities, infusing their energy within you, realigning yourself with order and repelling anything negative that you held on to or you incorporated since the last time that you connect. So we're accustomed to doing that. This text simply lays out the ritual invocations. So you go before each one of these divinities, you invoke them by name, you align your spirit with them. They then search out your body to make sure, your spirit body to make sure you're not in disalignment from that aspect of creation they govern. And then you can move on to the next divinity. So in ancient Kemet, when they're talking about after death, the person goes before these 42 assessors of Ma'at, these judges of Ma'at, and so forth. We did that during life, and then we do it one more time after death. So you're going before each one of them. One of them, you invoke the name of the divinity, incorporate their energy, and then you declare that you have not stolen because that's one of those deities governs that aspects of, aspect of creation. One of Another one says, I have not lied. I have not taken offerings from the shrines of the deities. I have not, you know, killed without just cause and so forth. Each one of the divinities governing different aspects of creation and different aspects of behavior. You go before the divinity, you invoke the name of the divinity, you invoke them, divinity itself, himself or herself, you incorporate their energy, and then you declare and prove and demonstrate that you spiritually have not violated the aspect of creation they govern. If you can pass through all 42, then you're allowed to go before Al-Sar and be accepted into the ancestral realm. Now, on a mundane level, if you were going to a family reunion and all the family was there and so forth, and they rented out an Airbnb and so forth in a certain city and everything was fine, and you were gonna, going to go, but then there was somebody else in the family who was you know, known to be a thief and a drug addict and so forth. Whenever they got around people, they would steal and try to steal their cars or steal money or whatever. You could go before the people and they would talk to you and so forth and allow you in the home and then you can dwell amongst the people and do what you need to do. But that other individual, once they approached and came to the door, they would be stopped and they would be questioned and so forth. And it would be demonstrated that Oh, you stole from this person, you stole from that person, you did drugs, you did this, you still engage in that kind of behavior, and they would not be allowed to enter into the community of harmony and balance. They would be repelled from that. If we lived a life of disorder or discordance, and then after we transition, our spirit leaves the body, and we go before the ancestresses and ancestors, and the abosom, the divinities, if we're a spirit that's out of harmony with order and we've demonstrated that disorder throughout the course of our lives, we're not allowed to dwell with the community of honored ancestors and ancestresses for the next couple of hundred years. We're outside of that. We're repelled from that. In order to be accepted into that community so you can live in the ancestral realm in harmony until it's time for you to reincarnate back into the physical world, you have to go through this test just like you went through when you were alive. Each one of these 42 divinities governs a different aspect of creation. The reason why that's important is because the 11th divinity, Kererti, is him right here, the seated bearded divinity. And the invocation for Kererti is Hail Kererti, coming forth from the land of the West. That's his title, you just invoke that divinity and then he comes forth. His energy, he manifests, just like pouring libation or engaging in ritual prayer and the spirit coming down to possess or coming to the shrine and so forth. Now that the divinity is manifest and his energy is present, 
and you're infusing that energy, then he searches out your spirit to see if you violated the aspect of creation he governs. So you said hell, KMT, coming forth from the land of the West. And let me just show you the, the Medutu for that. Ah, Kererti, Per M Amentet, Hail Kererti, the deity Kererti, Per M Amentet, coming forth from the land of the West, An Nuk Nuk. It says, I have not penetrated, meaning copulated, Nuk, with the penetrator, copulator. And if, as you can see, the term Nuk is the wavy line, which is the N sound the little bowl with the lip, which is the cut sound, that's nuck. And then you will see the erect phallus and testicles and so forth talking about that has to do with copulation, penetration or copulation. Nuck is the term in ancient command. And then you see the erect phallus with some of the floor being released, nuck once again. So it says on, you see the two hands right here saying on, not, have I not copulated not with a copulator? I have not penetrated a penetrator. I have not engaged in same quote unquote sex. You are not allowed to dwell with the divinities, the ancestresses and ancestors, unless you can prove that you have not engaged in this sexual activity. There are 42 different divinities. Kerati is one of them. The other ones, as we said, talks about not stealing, not murdering, meaning killing without a just cause. You can kill with a just cause. That's in harmony with order. But murder is unjust kill. You can kill in self-defense, and that's in harmony with divine order, and you're accepted by the divinity. But if you, you know, murder somebody, unjust killing, that's a different thing. So whether it's murder or rape or theft or dissexuality, homosexuality, or whatever these different disordered actions are, you're going before these different deities showing that you didn't violate the aspect of creation they govern. You cannot be accepted into the community of the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors without proving that you did not engage in this sexual activity. That's a divine prohibition against this sexual homosexual behavior. And it's the same for males and females. The erect phallus is also representative of the erect clitoris and so forth. When arousal happens for the woman, erection happens. When the arousal happens for the man, erection happens. So they use that symbolism for both. And you will find whether it's a papyrus for a male or a female, you will see the same text in, in either one. So that's the divine prohibition. And that has to do with the cosmology of aligning with the divine forces in creation. Now. There's another piece we want to tap into. And once again, that goes back to Ma'at and Ma'a, male, female forces of divine law and balance. Now, and of course, if you have any questions, you can post them in the chat room. Now, we published this article a while back and we did a, we've done some courses where we Included our analysis of this article. We're talking about the divinity Nekebet, who governs the respiratory system. But in that context, um, and she's her symbol is the great vulture and so forth. She is called Abba and Akan, and she's called Oba and Yoruba and Ayaba and Vodun and so forth. But we were talking about breath and the spirit, the Ba, the Baet. So let's get down to that part. So we said, as we draw in air and oxygen, we are also drawing in the solar fire of the Aten, Atenit, the sun. The co-mingling of air, oxygen, and the solar fire within oxygen has its corollary in the co-mingling of the sacred mood or vulture governing the lung structure. 
as the respiratory apparatus and the sacred ba or by a bird dwelling within the very same lung structure. So when you see Moot, the great vulture, what we did here with this chart in the Akan tradition, when we talk about day names, soul names, and so forth, like Kwesi, Kojo, Kofi, Ama, Abina, you're born on a certain day, you have a certain name. You're born on Friday, you're Afua if you're a woman. Um, Kofi, if you're a male, you're born on Sunday, you're Kwesi if you're a man, and Akosuya or Esi if you're a woman. Kwapena and Abena on Tuesday, and Kwaku or Kweku and Aku on Wednesday, and Yao Yao or Aba on Thursday. Um, Kojo and Ajua on Monday. So when we're talking about that, it's because we're named after the solar lunar Plan the deities that govern the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies, governing the seven-day week. We are born into the world on one of their days as an indication that we were assigned to these deities before we entered into the womb. So we're born on one of their days. So the community knows if you're born on a Kuada or Wednesday, then that means you were assigned, if you're a woman, to the divinity Akua pre-incarnation and she made sure you were born on her day, Wednesday, Akuada. So the community would know, oh, this girl, the deity Akua, who is called Nebet Head and Kemet, but Akua governs this girl. Her name is going to be Akua. She's come here to carry that Akua energy into the world. The same with all the other divinities. We show the relationship of the different major body systems. These are the shrines in the physical body of these divinities. So the reproductive with Alcetta or Ajua, the immune and lymphatic systems with Vena and Avena, which is Heru, Behudet, and Sekhmet, and so forth. But then when you get to Aba, which is Nekabet, you'll see she governs the respiratory system and so forth. So that great vulture with the great wings, the expansive wings, when you look at your respiratory apparatus and so forth, you see the breast of the bird is like where the heart is and so forth, and the lungs are the wings, and where the wings expand and contract, that's the inflation and deflation of the lungs and so forth. So there's a great you know, bird within your chest expanding and contracting, that's the animate force, the wing force, dealing with the air and so forth inside your body. That's the force right there. You have that great bird sitting in your chest. She's dealing with the expansion and contraction in the context of breathing, pulling in air and oxygen and so forth. But within the air, of course, is the oxygen. So you have air, but then you have solar fire within the air. You have the great vulture inside the body governing the lung structure. But then within that, you have the oxygen. Spiritually, you know, you have your expansive force and then you have the fire energy. In ancient Kemet, that's called the Ba or Ba, ba for males, Ba for females. It's a little solar bird with the head of the person who governs it. So you'll see the Ba as the body of a bird, the head of the person who, who you know, who it's attached to and so forth, or sometimes a bird with a solar disc on the head. What it's talking about is the divine living energy, your life force energy, that solar fire within you. There's an animate, meaning winged force, the animate fire. This is a bowl of burning incense with a flame coming out of it, a bowl of burning incense. So that means you have an animate wing fire inside of you. That expansive, fiery energy is called your ba. If you're male, by it. If you're female, that is your spirit, your divine living energy. Your ka or kaya, your soul is your divine consciousness, the force in your head region. But the divine living energy that circulates throughout your blood, that moves throughout your arms, legs, your entire physical body and spirit body, that life force energy is your ba or by it, the divine living energy. Now. 
And here's another representation of, you know, a Bob Burr just showing us an animate fire within you. And we talk about how that, you know, entity dwells within. But here, you see, after the person is deceased, you have the male, but then his little Bob Bird, the divine living energy goes outside of his spirit body and gets rejuvenated, receiving libation from the divinity newt. The same with the woman, her spirit gets outside of her body. She receives the libation or replenished energy of newt. She feeds on that. And then she jumps it back inside of the body of the person to animate the person. That's like if your energy left you for a minute and then it came back to you and so forth. So the spirit of the person is nourished and rejuvenated by newt. She's inside the tree, just like you go outside and you go by the trees where all the oxygen is and you are totally rejuvenated and purified and so forth. Well, spiritually, your spirit is nourished by newt as well. This doesn't just happen in the after death state. This happens when you engage in meditation, any form of ritual practice and so forth. You strengthen or replenish your body or your body. That is your divine living energy. It's the divine force, that radiant force that extends beyond your physical body. Even on the mundane level, the body heat coming from you for Afurakani, Afurakani people only, that's the manifestation of that force. Now we have a ba or ba, a spirit that animates us. They show it as, you know, symbolically as an animate force, a bird with wings that has a bowl of burning incense in front of it and so forth with the head of the man or head of the woman that that spirit belongs to. When you experience the ba on a mundane level, you just feel some energy moving through your body. When you experience the ba on a ritual level, you can communicate with that male spirit or that female spirit. She or he has been sent by their parents, which is Rod and Rod, the creator and great trust. They send one of their children, one of their spirits to take up residence inside of you. Just like you have a bunch of different organs and they have their own forms and their own functions, their own entities. They, the heart has its own form and structure. It looks different from the lungs, looks different from the liver, looks different from the spleen, pancreas. You have different organs. You also have different spiritual organs within your spirit body. You have a physical body with a bunch of different organs. And you can say, well, the brain does this, the heart does that, the lungs does do this, and the liver does this and so forth. Well, in your spirit body, you have a number of different spiritual organs. And each one of those organs are governed by our divinity and they have their own function. It's like each organ in your body is governed by a divinity and has its own function. Your ba is that circular psych, um, energy circulating and cycling through your body. It is a child of Ra and Riot in Yonkonpon and Yonkonton. When you engage the ritual process, you can communicate with that spirit, with him, if you're a male, her, if you're a female, you'll experience that divinity <clears throat> and you can have a relationship with that spiritual force. That's through ritual song, ritual dance, ritual chant, ritual prayer, ritual movement, uh, ritual copulation, these various ritual meditation, these various gateways to the trance state. Meditation is a cool gateway to the spirit realm. Ritual dance is a more fiery gateway to the spirit realm. Ritual chant is more of a cool gateway to the spirit realm. Ritual song is a more cool gateway. So whether you're singing and sound vibrations, you know, cause spirit possession to happen or spirit communication to happen, that propelled you into the spirit realm. Open that incision so you can move through that incision and get to the spirit realm. If you were engaged in ritual dance and you were dancing and spinning and, you know, fell into spirit possession or spirit communication, that was a more fiery gateway to open that incision so you can get to the spirit realm and communicate with the Abosum and the Salam. But the means by which you communicate is when you're engaged in ritual invocation, what's actually happening is you're connecting your solar force, your Ba, your energy force with the Ba of the deity or the Ba of the ancestral spirit. You build a bridge of energy, just like solar light, a solar light 
from your solar energy, building a bridge of that to the um, divinity. And there's an exchange across that bridge of energy where spirit possession can take place, spirit communication can take place, and so forth. There's also a bridge built between us as Afurakani men and women. The ba of the male, as you can see here, and the ba of the female are complementary opposites. The spirit of the male and the spirit of the female, the spirit dwelling in the male, spirit dwelling in the female, complementary opposites. If you try to get a spirit dwelling in the body of a male and then try to connect that with the spirit dwelling in the body of another male, that creates discordance. No different than two magnets on the table with the same polarity facing. They repel one another without touching. When you have the opposite polarities facing, when they get close enough, they jump together and they stay together until you pull them apart. But if they're the same polarities facing, negative and negative and positive and positive, or north and north and south and south, you put them near each other, they will repel. You try to put them near each other again, they will repel. And the only way you can put them together and hold them together, you unnaturally force them together and hold them. But as soon as you let them go, nature will cause them to repel because it's not natural for them to be together on the same polarities. When you have a relationship with your ba, your ba'at, the spirit that comes directly from, and let's show once again where the spirit comes from. Second, all right. Okay, so the Ba is a child of Ra. The Ba'at is a child of Ra. So, of course, the Ba and Ba'at, they are children of Ra and Ra. They give birth to spiritual forces that are sent to take up residence inside of us. And when you engage the ritual process, it becomes more than just a sensation of energy that you feel you communicate directly with the divinity. You communicate directly with that spiritual force that was sent to dwell within. So when we're talking about relationships and sexuality and the balance of male and female and gender and so forth, we're talking about being grounded in masculinity and femininity. There's no quote unquote fluidness between that. You have the male and the female and gender begins in the spirit realm and manifests in the physical realm. You can see an ancestress or an ancestor. They're not in a physical body, but there's still a female spirit or a male spirit. This idea that, you know, spirits have no gender until they get into a physical body is pure stupidity. That was created by Europeans trying to create fluidity within sexuality so they can engage in their perversity. You can't, on one hand, pretend like you're communicating with ancestresses and ancestors and talk about that all day long and then turn around and talk about spirit has no gender, no color. The ancestresses and ancestors are still black. They have color in the spirit realm and they still have gender in the spirit realm because it originates there. Amen and Amenet, spiritual forces, they are the foundation of gender. Ra and Ra, the creator and creatress, Ra is a male divinity. A male force, right, is a female divinity, female force. Spirits with gender. The manifestation of gender in the physical realm is the final phase of incarnation, but it begins in the spirit realm. So color and gender, spiritual first, and it manifests in the physical world because it began in the spirit realm as that energy complex. So when we're talking about union between man and woman, sexuality, gender, balance in the hoodoo tradition. This is Rod Riot, Yonkompon, Yonkompon, the creator and great trust and so forth. Same culture that we've always had. When we engage in ritual um, song or ritual chant or ritual drumming or ritual dance in the hoodoo tradition, we establish a shrine and communicate with our ancestresses and ancestors and the deities, male and female, that govern us. We invoke the Ba or Ba'at. Even if we didn't know the words Ba and Ba'at because we forgot that over the past 300 years, 
but we invoke the spirit that was sent to dwell within us and we communicate with that spirit. We see that spirit, hear that spirit, invoke that spirit to accomplish our objectives and also lead us to the spirit of the opposite sex that is our balance. We're still invoking the bond by it. Now, And one of the other articles we did, and we did an entire six-week course on this, parts one and parts two, but we talked about this notion of the ba and ba'et that we just showed, ba'iti, which is a term in ancient Kemet, ba'iti, which means the two twin t ba spirits. That's the origin of the term and concept of the twin flame. And in fact, let's just pull that up. We're going to pull that up in the, pull that up in the hieroglyphic dictionary just so you can see it. But if you like to, if you have any questions, of course, you can post them in the chat room. We're just about done. Just want to show you this, this information. And there's a specific uh, a specific entry within the hieroglyphic dictionary you need to see. And if you have, if you have the, uh, hold on one second, let me make sure this is on. Okay. Okay, so as you can see in the hieroglyphic dictionary, you see the term ba, even though they use the term soul, but it's really not soul as spirit. They didn't understand that um, the difference between soul and spirit, but we can show which one of our books we show the etymology of the word spirit and show that the ba is the spirit, the ka is that the soul. They flip that around and say the ka is the spirit and the ba is the soul, but it's actually the reverse. So it's not the soul, God is the spirit. That's ba. Then you have ba'et. It's not the soul goddess, but the spirit goddess, but it's, you know, the spirit. So you have ba and ba'et. But then you have by T. And T has to do with dual or duality in the language of Kemet, meaning two. And even when you look at the term T and TO and later TO and duo and dual and so forth in English, when you trace the etymology of the term two, it goes back to um, two or twi or T. And this is where you get twin, which is twi and so forth. And then D-I, D like dipole and so forth, meaning two and, or diachronic and so forth. Um, but you'll see that the term T means dual in the language of command. Ba and Ba'et, the male spirit, female spirit, then Ba'et is the two or the twin spirits. 
here it says the two divine souls, but really two divine spirits and so forth, the two spirits and the two chafui. Now, so when we were talking about that in this um, article, If you look at the term for ba, you have the bird here, and then you have the bowl with the little flame, and this is an actual colorful image of that. The bowl with the flame, it's a bowl of burning incense, and the flame is arising, and of course, the smoke, but you see the flame coming out of the bowl. That's what this is actually representing. This is an actual image of that. And then you see here the ba bird, and once again, you have the bowl with the burning incense. So you have a Animate, once again, fire dwelling within. This is a man and his wife and so forth. Transition and then their Ba and Bayat are standing on a shrine before them as they're going through the process in the spirit realm and so forth. And then you see here the man and woman being replenished by Newt. And this is another version of that. Separately, the woman and her spirit, her by it, being, you know, replenished by Newt, rejuvenated, purified. The man and his by, his spirit being purified by Newt and so forth, rejuvenated, rejuvenated, replenished and so forth. So when they're replenished in balance, then they can come together. The ba, the bayat come together as bai T, the dual T spirits that ba is that divine flame. So you have ba, the flame, t, dual, that's the dual or the twin, t, ba, flame. That is the origin of the twin flame concept and literally the term itself. Literally seeing a bow with a flame arising, dealing with the spirit of the individual that it's associated with, that's the twin flame concept. And then in this article, we talk about the cosmology associated with Shu and Tefnut. And this notion of twin flames being together in the beginning spiritually, then there was a separation when Tefnut went further south and she separated and so forth and took all the water with her to the south and so forth. And then Ra directed Shu along with Tehuti to go to the south, to go connect, reconnect with Tefnut and bring her back and so forth so abundance could be brought back to the land. So that was the two twin flame spirits together, separated and coming back together and so forth. That cosmology of um, Shu and Tefnut deals with that, including the title twin flame itself. So we go into detail about that. Um, and we have a couple of courses where we deal with that. And I'll just show you the, the link to those real quick. On our Akungwa Suya page, we have 34 online courses that we've done, and all of them are archived. So some of them are six weeks, some of them are four weeks, and you can access them and you know watch them whenever you want to. The six-week courses are $15, and the four-week courses are $10. Um, that was 50% off. But when you look at the different flyers, you'll see what we covered. And what we did with those were just going to get down to the those two particular courses. Uh, so we did Baiti Seneb, the Cosmology of Divine Twin Flame Marriage Part One talking about the marriage of the deities like Amen and Amenet, Shu and Tefnut, Ra and Ra'et, Atem and Atemet, Kepra and Keprit, as well as Pata and Segmet, and uh, Mentu and Tananet. So we have those. And then Baiti Seneb part two, which was another six week course. It was the second part. We talked about Geb and Newt, 
our sar and our set, set and nebit het, min and het eru, um, happy and merit, and then this one is mentu and tananet and so forth. So the marriages of the deities, amen and amen and shu and teftu and asar and aset and ron, right? These marriages of the divinities are a model for the balanced relationships of afurakani men, afurakani women. That's when we talk about hudu and sexuality and the balance of male and female and so forth. Our functioning in the world is a reflection of how the male and female forces that govern different aspects of creation harmoniously how they interact and interface in a balanced way, our relationships are a reflection of them. So when we understand their cosmology and we invoke them ritually and pull that energy within us, then we can realign ourselves. So we go into detail about that in those courses. And one of them, we mentioned Hapi and Merit. Um, in February, we have our annual Hapi Merit retreat on Edisto Island, one of the Gullah Islands in South Carolina, one of our sacred ancestral lands and so forth, where our people escaped enslavement and established independent sovereign settlements. We defended ourselves militarily and built independent settlements, freed ourselves from enslavement and so forth. That Gullah Island, one of the Gullah Islands, Edisto Island is where we go in February, um, and it's called Hapi and Merit. Hapi is the male force of the Nile River, but Merit is the female divinity of the Nile River. And there's the Southern Hapi and the Northern Hapi, a Southern Merit and the Northern Heri, uh, Northern Merit and so forth, but Hapi and Merit, and of course Hapi is the water, you know, bearer and so forth, is where they stole Aquarius from and so forth, but he's the spiritual force that animates on the masculine side that the Nile River, she's the feminine force, and inside your body, the rivers in your body, they animate the rivers in your body. Hapi governs the arteries, and Merit governs the veins. So, and the arteries send the blood throughout the body, and the veins capture the, you know, deoxygenated blood and return it to the place where it can be reoxygenated and purified and so forth, so it can go back through the arteries and start the entire circulatory process again. So, Hapi and Merit have shrines in our bodies, but just like the, you know, the rivers on earth feed the entire nation and so forth, the rivers in your body, the arteries and veins feed the, all the cells in the body without a circulatory system. It doesn't matter how many organs and glands you have, everything falls apart unless Hapi and Merit are functioning harmoniously. There's no nation building without the proper balance of Hapi and Merit. So we go into detail about that. But we have workshops for men, Afrakani men, Afrakani women, as well as United and so forth. Um, vegan food ritual on the ocean, ritual at the Harriet Tubman or Nana Apina Aramita bridge on the Kombahi River and so forth. A number of different things that happen at that retreat in uh, February on Esto Island. But we brought that up because of the, once again, that notion of Hapi and Marie balanced Afurakani men, Afurakani women energy functioning together. So okay, so we're gonna end it. Um if you have some questions, someone said in the chat room, is remaining celibate until finding your divine complement a common practice in the Akan tradition? That's always been a common practice. It's a common practice, you know, in various Afurakani, Afurakani traditions. Typically, in a traditional setting, people don't spend years, you know, searching for somebody because everybody's in the same culture, they're living in the same or, you know, connected villages, they speak the same language, they have the same values and so forth. So it's not difficult to find somebody, you know, who's practicing the tradition because everybody's practicing the same tradition. Everybody's basically on the same page. You know, now when Western culture, white perverse culture comes in and people are you know, embracing different white cultural norms and so forth. And, you know, they have different perverse values, then different things change. And then we come over, you know, you come over to North America and we, you know, people are embracing all these different perverse values. It may be a little bit longer before you reconnect with somebody who's on the same 
page as you, of course, you're not going to, you know, try to embrace somebody who's worshiping a fictional cartoon character, Jesus, and praying to a fictional white character, whether white or black, still a fictional character, or Islam or Christianity or Hebrewism or any pseudo fake religious practice that creates disorder. So it may be a little bit longer, but yes, it's a common practice to connect with the person. Once you connect with the person who is your balance, then you, you know, that's when the celibacy ends and marriage happens and so forth. And when people do that, even if people haven't been doing that, and if someone is single and so forth, taking time off to engage in ritual celibacy as well as cyclical fasting, that's a purificatory practice. And in fact, as a matter of fact, we just um, scroll right by that on our page. So let me go back to that page. If you look at the, um, looking at our page once again, this particular course, this is one of our six week courses and of course it's archived. So this is one of the $15 courses that you can access. Um, Ab, Ritual Celibacy and Cyclical Fasting for Alignment. So we talk about it cosmologically, ritually and so forth. And we go through that in that particular course. And we're talking about different things, but foundationally, the, the manner in which you can purify yourself, realign yourself physically and spiritually is through that process of ritual celibacy and cyclical fasting. So the entire six-week course is just on that. But yes, that is a common practice. And you'll recognize the benefits from it once you once you go through that process and then you you know you take the time and say, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna engage in cyclical fasting and ritual celibacy and so forth. And once you go through, for example, the first full year of celibacy and you recognize, you know, the difference in your energetic output and how more disciplined and how in control you are of yourself, you'll see the benefits of that. So, and have you, you know, replenish your energy in a number of different ways. All right. Okay, so that is, um, those things are coming up, but also, of course, you know, the purpose that we were having these uh, live discussions, our Hudu Mind Hudu Nation Festival is coming up um, next weekend in Atlanta, October 15th. So you'll see the information here on our page, the Hudu Mind page have presentations, we're gonna have vendors, we're gonna be talking about the Hudu tradition in different aspects and so forth. That is coming up. All of the information is on the page. You'll see that here, you'll see the trailer and so forth. We're gonna put this live that we did in the previous live up on this page as well. It's already, the previous live is on our uh, YouTube page, but if you would like to, you know, we'll, and we put it on Facebook, but we'll also put it on this page as well. But you'll see the details here. So. $20 fee, but that includes a full course vegan lunch. Plus, you can download the free Hudu ebooks. We have um, the Hudu Journal 1, 2, and 3, as well as the Hudu People book that we just um, talked about. But this is our eighth annual. Normally, we have this event in Washington, D.C., where we are based. Um, but we decided to move it to Atlanta this, this year. So, and we... Um, back in March when we have our annual Edgy Sign Conference because of the whole COVID issue and they were still, you know, deal, making people take tests to come into venues here in D.C. Back then, we had done the seventh annual um, Edgy Sign Conference back in March. Instead of doing it in D.C., we did it in Atlanta. So we have our eighth annual Hudu Mind Festival. This will be the first time that we've ever had it outside of D.C. We're having it in Atlanta this time. Um, so you can join us for that. And then also, hold on a second. Let me just put this out here. Our Kanche Kanje Film Festival, our first annual Kanche. We just talked about Kanche 
talking about ritual invocation. Conjure Film Festival is November 26th here in Washington, DC. The first time we've ever done this is gonna be an annual festival. We will be premiering our new documentary, Who Do Akan Ancestral Religion in North America? We also have our award-winning documentary that we did a few years ago, Amado Kafwa Visa, African-American Ancestral Divination. We will be showcasing films from other independent filmmakers. We'll have vendors, we'll have presentations, a number of different things. So this is um, on the Miminida, the Saturday, November 26th. Tickets are available now. You will see that the event is at the ARC Theater in Washington, D.C., and this is the ARC Theater. So it's a certain number of seats. Um, we have some available, still available. You can go to the website, kanjfilms.com, and, you know, get tickets for that. We look forward to connecting with you. So that's what's coming up also. So that's November 26th. It happens to be the same weekend of the so-called Thanksgiving weekend. Most people are home from, you know, work or, or college and so forth. So that's that Saturday during the day on Saturday. Um, and the final piece is our, we mentioned earlier, our tour to Kemet and Kanit, Egypt and Nubia, May 23rd through May 31st. This is our second annual tour. Um, we'll be going to 12 different cities from Northern Kemet all the way to Nubia in the South. And you will see the information there. We put out these 13 videos you see. Um, it's footage from the recent trip um, to Kemet, seeing the different cities we've gone to and different things that we saw and so forth and experienced, just to give you an idea of what you will experience when you go on the trip and so forth. So um, we do have a few spaces still open for that. You can put a deposit down and there are payment plans. Um, you know. October, November, December, January, February, March, April, and into the beginning of May, you still have time to make payment, monthly payments and so forth. So um, all that information is there on the site. And for the brothers, um, we just started a couple of weeks ago, our 13 week, uh, hold on one second. Um, Afurakani Manhood course, once again, we've done two weeks and we have 12 sessions left. There are 14 Awusidara Sundays within this 13 week cycle. So the Obedi Masem Afurakani Manhood course, where we examine our Afurakani Manhood book, which is the one we just talked about earlier, this book, as well as our Patah Sasa Tim book. And then we have 14 other books that we deal with in the 14 weeks. Um, dealing with, you know, the principles of manhood and so forth. That course, if you would like to deal with, come through with late registration and come through and join through the late registration process, you can. The first two weeks, the videos you will have access to when you register. So you can catch up. And then the next 12 sessions, the final 12 sessions, of course, you'll be able to access the live sessions as well as have access to the video, video recordings of all of them. So if you ever miss any sessions or, or if you would just like to review them, you'll have, you know, perpetual access to all 14 sessions. So we've only done two weeks so far. We have 12 left. So if you would like to register for late registration, you can go to our website, the Obedima page. It's every Sunday morning, Awusida, Sunday morning from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. and so forth. We finish that up. And, you know, in the morning, so people can have the rest of the day to do what they need to do and so forth. So um, that's ongoing as well. Okay, yes, and a final note about the books. Send me an email about the books, because what we're doing, the person asked a question about the books. What we're doing now for the first time is we're shifting our books over to Amazon. So. Um, just so you can see the uh, see what we're talking about. This is our publications page. So, and you'll see all of the books here, all thirty-one books. Um, now, the ebook versions of all thirty-one of our books, you can download all of them for free on our website at any time. 
And then we have the soft cover versions that we sell and people purchase them and we ship them out and everything. But what we're doing now, we're in the process of doing right now is we're moving them all to Amazon. So we won't be printing them out anymore. You know, it'll be going through Amazon. We're almost done with that process, but it'll take the next, um, it may take a few weeks. So uh, if you order some books, we can do two things. You can send us an email. We'll give the, the option. We can refund you and then you can, you know, wait for the Amazon or we might be able to do the last few books because um, we're winding up the printing process. We might be able to print out the last few. We had an issue with um, two of the printers recently. If we can take care of that, then we can send those out. But if not, we can, you can either wait for the Amazon to come through or we can just refund you. And then once the once they're all on Amazon, then we can, you know, give you a link. So just send us an email about that and we'll decide which option, which option you prefer. All right. All right. Okay, so if there aren't any more questions, we can go ahead and end it here. We're gonna, like I said, save this one. It'll be up on YouTube, but we're also posted on our page. So if if you know somebody else you know missed it or something, you can let them know about that. But uh, we'll keep you updated on our Instagram page, Facebook page, on the Hockey Man re Retreat. We have about eight spaces left for that retreat in South Carolina for February. So you can check out the information on Happy Mary. Email us if you have any questions. Um, but check that out. Check out the flyer. Look at the information and everything if you're interested in that. There's a prere prerequisite for that. There are certain courses you would need to take, um, which you can download those. Well, you know, you can access them through the course page because they're all archived. But for that particular retreat, people need to be on the same page. So there's a certain few courses like the Ubin Shang and Kuku Tuntun that you need to be aware of. Um, but then also the trip to Kemet and the film festival. But the first thing coming up, of course, is Kudu Mine in Atlanta. Some people are traveling from out of state and so forth. We have probably about 12, 13, um, something like 12, 13, or maybe 15 spaces left for the Atlanta uh, Kudu Mine festival if you would like to get tickets for that. So just go to the website and you can access that. So once again, yet I say we thank everybody for joining in with us and your bitch we will meet again. That's all.